There we go. Alright, so I um, might as well start us off. Hello everyone, welcome to the first Matt and Co. Talk Who in what feels like years. Um, it's because um, like I was ill one month, Skype happened, or not Skype, like Google Hangouts just stopped being a viable option to do live. So, yeah. But it's back on my channel after we briefly had one on the Hooniversals for Big Finish Month. But anyways, I, I'm being selfish right now by not having my guests introduce themselves, so uh, f fight over it, I guess. Alright, I'll go first. I'll, I'll take the, uh, the centre stage. Um, hello, my name is Isaac Keats. I'm a very passionate Who fan. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on the show, Matt. Thank you very much. You, well, thank you for being here. And I'm Thomas O. James. I'm uh, uh, the other member, well, not the other member, but the other uh, out of the five members of the Universals, uh, the newest one, the one who'll probably get cancelled at the end of the year by Mark Graves. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's not, you're not getting cancelled, you're having an 18 month hiatus. <laughs> <laughs> Although space, space Shark Productions will, will make sure I'll get that hit. <laughs> He's already made sure Ben had one. You will be that, but you'll be replaced with uh, somebody who's perhaps more comedic than you. Ian Levine. Like Scottish as well. <laughs> huh. yeah. So, um, that was a rumour, wasn't there? Oh, don't start. <laughs> And that's all we need to know. It was a rumor. It's it's BS. Moving on. Yeah. Just. It was like it was like other night. I was like, oh, this is gonna be real. And then all of a sudden, I was like, complete days. Like I just couldn't even wait to get to sleep. I waited and waited and waited. I saw that on the morning. I think after somebody had made that on Gallifrey Base. I'm not part of Gallifrey Base. Um, not necessarily because I don't like it, but because I'm already part of the forum, which is already fantastic. It's called TARDIS Builders. Um, it's a collection of people. You may have heard of it. I don't know, but it's a collection of people who build their own uh, TARDIS consoles, models, props, and everything. And everyone there, generally, is really nice. Um, the one thing I've noticed about Gallifrey Base is that, obviously, it's a lot more general, so it's more discussion about the show itself. And hmm. the thing I noticed is that after it was put on Gallifrey Base, it spread like wildfire. And on TARDIS Builders, there's a, a lot more kind of, well, we, we don't necessarily take things as fact until it's announced on either the BBC has a press release or sometimes we'll say the Radio Times and add a push the mirror. Or is it the, who, who is it that usually has the... Um, the it's the, it's the, the, usually the Daily the Mirror who usually uh, sometimes puts yeah. out a lot of yeah. these uh, rumours now. It was very interesting. Because they, they were the one who did the Cybermen, I think. When, when yeah, I think they I, were the people I, who I, said, yeah, "Are the Cybermen coming back?" Mm. Mine did. Mine, I remember them like ten years ago. I remember they like announced that like uh, uh, some like uh, I don't know, Ben Kingsley's Davros, two thousand eight. Like, well, well, that that, that they were half never, right. Never, never agree with them ever since then. To be honest, I, I yeah. always am very. I'm speculative whenever it comes to those sorts of rumours because yeah. I don't like to... I find myself beginning to type out comments. Like, I have I have typed out full paragraphs of comments and just deleted them because I thought, if I add to this, I'm only fueling what, what, what they want. So when, uh, like, there's a channel called Bolus Trek. I, I think... Oh, that, yeah. Like, yeah, Him. I... I he keeps on popping up in my recommended, a uh, very popular channel. Um, and I, I find myself, he says something, and I think, okay, I'll respond to that. But then I think, actually, I I don't necessarily want to put my opinion out there. Um, mm -hmm. When, I mean, obviously, you saw with the Chris Chibnall rumour, everyone was either love it or hate it. It was a bit like Marmite, really. You, you had yeah. loads of people who were going, oh, yeah, finally, it's all over. And then you had other people who were saying, yeah, but he hasn't really had a chance. I mean, yeah. it's like with um, with Christopher Eccleston, you know, he he left early on and it was a shame. And he, he showed his doctor really well throughout 
his entire series, but then there was a longer series. But with this, they've only had really 10 episodes to show what they can do. And it's, I think that I, with my own opinion, I'm happy to talk about my own opinion when asked about it, but when it actually comes to commenting on other people's videos, I, I'm much more careful about what I say and what I do because I think, well, mm -hmm. somebody's, whatever happens, somebody's not going to like this and it's just not worth getting into an argument with somebody because mm -hmm. you think everyone's entitled to what they think. Yeah. Um, and obviously when it comes to those kinds of rumours, I was like, well, we'll see, we'll see where it goes. Yeah. yeah. I, I personally thought it was just a, it it was just not real because like there's rumors of Whitaker and Chibnall leaving all the time. Although this time it was different because it wasn't Whitaker that's leaving. It's just Chibnall in yeah. this rumor. So so well, it's a different spin. The, apparently, apparently, uh, apparently, uh, uh, like uh, due to I'm gonna I'm uh, I don't know if I should discuss this when it's my turn. Okay, uh, so are we doing like these kind of like separate terms of like to speak about it or not? <laughs> Anything goes really. All right. Well, I was going to say about, like, um, I've got this mate who um, follows Dr. Freedom. He was one of the big uh, people who were kind of, uh, like, uh, like campaigning, uh, campaigning against the rumour, like, campaigning with the rumour, saying, like, this is true, this is, all true. I think he was, like, the ringleader of her. Uh, but he wasn't, it wasn't the person who did it. It was, like, he was the ringleader on YouTube for, like, most of my, uh, all that kind of happened on, the, uh, it spread by wildfire on YouTube, and, um, uh, apparently, uh, there's been stuff saying like Whitaker was also leaving as well in 2021 or something like that, or Series 12 was going to have a regeneration, it was going to be last minute added in or something like that. And that's the reason why, you know, Chibbles. Hmm. We were going to have a repeat of Colin Baker. It, yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> I, just, I just feel like, you know, it, was, it, it, it wasn't true. Yeah. And I, as soon as I heard, like, oh, that it's Dr. Freedom doing this, and then I was like, yeah, I've. I've listened. I've seen the Doctor Freedom stuff before. He isn't really. He's like not. He, he, he's not. Not at all. Um, yeah. Correct. Maybe. Maybe like once or twice. Maybe once or twice. But I've never actually. Well, actually, I've never really seen the videos. I've kind of heard them the group time, but apparently he's just not really. Like, yeah. yeah if you ask me, the best thing to come out of these rumors is probably all of the memes on Twitter. I love how after it's kind of oh, it's been confirmed. Yeah. You have all of the people like I. There's I, I can't. My, my favorite, more. my favorite one was Doctor Poop's one, like uh, Cow and Bonkers. Absolutely. If if, if if anybody hasn't seen that one yet. Oh yeah. It um was it from uh, Fear Her? Yeah, it was from Fear Her. Like um, it was the councilman. Cal oh, I think it's Bonkers. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's the one I was talking about. It's yeah. Just, like it was so funny. I was like, oh. I'm <laughs> Cal from the council should be a companion. Changed my mind. I, I can't. Big, I think everybody would probably agree with Big that. Finish, do it. I dare you. They it, even, Big Finish, they even managed to make a character. I haven't seen it, but they made a character out of the newsreader, the American newsreader. Yeah. Oh, that was brilliant. Oh, I thought, Big Finish, we'll see a character who appeared on screen maybe collectively for maybe five minutes, and they'll go, you know what, we can make an adventure out of them. And they somehow, man I would really like to see... Actually, no, I'd like to see him um, join Torchwood. Oh my well, god, uh, yes! The, the, the supposed movie. movie. Apparently, to that uh, news reader kind of story, also talked for it, for it back in the end of time. I've, uh, I, I, my favourite book um, of all time, really, is The Writer's Tale, and apparently there's a scene in there that was kind of supposed to be like in the beginning, but like, well, the end of Trinity Bell, so she's going to get like a full scene with David and that, and Apparently, if you read Start Searching, kind of thinking it, uh, uh, there was going to be a whole two part or about Trinity Wells um, at one point. So, yeah, it's, I think it's just been really an idea. So, I don't think it's like a yeah. completely new idea, I think it's just like an idea that's been put around. Maybe yeah, yeah. It sounds like something that will probably be picked up. Yeah. I'm yeah. just surprised they got that. I'm surprised they get like actresses and actors and actresses like, from those, like, from like, you know, say 2005, 2006, because I was recently listening to uh, Stink from Talk Food, uh, the one with that that was in it, and uh, I was like, absolutely amazed, like, the character's kind of like, much better, and I'll, I'll say this, best of Ian episode, not good. Hmm. Like, and they're not, should, they're not even in that, it's not really explained, it's just, I don't know. I don't know, 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 I don't
don't know if anyone heard about the um again another rumor this seems to be a theme mm. uh that russell t davies and john barrowman were in fact in talks to do a torchwood movie did you hear about that yeah, yeah that was that was the radio times the time and that was like was it the radio times i can't remember it was I, might I, be the radio times i seem to remember that but i can't remember yeah and i was i was thinking <sighs> Uh, John, you know, John Barrowman has been camping back on TV. I mean, I think there was that whole array of him back in like 2016, 2017, asking like Russell and asking Stephen that they didn't go out well. So mm. apparently, kind of like, yeah. But I, I don't think he, he I think he, I think he would try to. But I just don't I, think. Yeah, I think John yeah. Barrowman is, um, he is absolutely, if anyone was to return to Doctor Who, I think. Put to a poll, he would probably definitely be up there. Captain Jack Harkness, I think, definitely would return. Yeah, I think he would be my candidate for a, re- a returning character because I mean that everyone's been talking about series twelve having um, more returning monsters, like people are talking about the Sea Devils and the Cybermen uh, and the Master. As and well. of course, we know the Jadun are coming back. Yeah, and actually, I I I don't know if you saw that on my Twitter, but I was there. On the second film yeah. day, and I met yeah. Jodie Whittaker, yeah. and I have a framed photo oh. I'm sitting on my desk right now, and it's probably the uh, proudest photo I have. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I saw the new look Jadoon, I saw their helmets, I saw one walking out. Um, but yeah, I mean, having all of these returning monsters, um, I think if you were to have a companion that join the TARDIS once again, I think Captain Jack would definitely be a good choice. Yeah. Like, certainly out of all the New Who companions, I would say so. Yeah, I suppose. But the thing is, would they have to fill the torture at the finish route, or would they have to kind of now just, like, decanonize it? Even though, like, Russell has been uh, well, slightly involved, well, majorly involved in the first like, real continuation of Series 9. Just so. set it a lot later in his timeline. Yeah, you'd have to do it like uh, yeah, far yeah, in the future. Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah. Like, you know, I really do need to listen to like more of the Tortured Big Finishes because the stuff I have listened to is really good, and I've just got Aliens Among Us on my shelf, and I'm just like, yeah, I need to listen to that, but I haven't had like the the time. That makes sense because I had a lot of like things on priority to listen to before, and now it's summer. Oddly enough, like I I usually listen to Big Finish the best when I'm on a commute, um, which going to uni. So yeah, mm-hmm. that's gonna that's gonna yeah. be good. I'll, I'll just dedicate like two a couple of weeks just so I could listen to all of it back to back. Yeah. I haven't. I have. I must confess, I haven't actually listened to all that much Big Finish, and I'm really irritated with myself because every time I see, like, um, I mean, there's shops literally round the corner that I could walk to that are stocking like the Big Finish vinyls. I'm a big vinyl m- man. I, uh, I have. I recently picked up the Doctor Who sound effects uh, LP from I think 1978 or 1979, along with Hitchhiker's Guide from the Galaxy. Um, and I, I, uh, Hitchhikers was a brilliant listen. And from what I've heard of Big Finish, it, it, it's very visual in the way that it presents its audio. But yeah. I see people posting on Twitter, I've got mine, I've got mine. And I think, oh, I should go around and get one. And then I don't. And it's such a shame because I love Big Finish and I've barely even listened to a full story. Mm. Yeah. The problem is I just don't have a vinyl, so that's, that's the reason why I haven't been able to get them. Yeah, I would, I would buy a vinyl, but uh, I would buy a vinyl player. But then again, it's just like it, it, once you buy the vinyl player, you haven't got that much time to buy the vinyls because like yeah. they'll sell like hotcakes and uh, yeah, you know. So I just I just have not really. I I, I just same, yeah. Same, sorry, it's the same with the uh, the collection. But then again, with the collection on Blu-ray, that's that's a different ordeal. What thing. would you say about the BBC re-releasing series twelve on? Or, or should I say season 12 yeah. on Blu-ray? Because I've got my... Oh, 
I did have my collection next to me, but I, I have got all of the collection Blu-rays apart from Series 12, and it was because it was such a limited run and nobody really knew um, how yeah. much it would take off. And I got one for Christmas, and I thought, well, I've got one, so I've got to have them mm -hmm. all now. What would you say, what would your be, opinion be on them re-releasing it, whether or not it's, it's supposed to be a limited collector's edition, you can't re-release it, you have to find one yourself, or do you think it would be more fair on the people who didn't realise or didn't see at the time what, what, how big of a thing it would be? Mm. Do you reckon that they should re-release it and say, okay, here's a limited run release? Or do you think that they should just say, well, you've got to find one on your own? I, I'm i probably going to go for go find one on your own because then if, if they re-release it, it means then the people who miss out season 18, 19, and then the, kind of the recent ones, you, you're, you're allowing a chance to re-release those. And the BBC are like, well, you should have bought those when you got the time. And those were well, well more known than the season, eight, season 12 one. So it, it, I, I, I know that sounds a little bit like I'm being a bit ridiculous, but to be, to be honest, I, I do feel like it, it allows the chance for them to keep back and begging for... I can see like, what you yeah. mean. Yeah. Do you think it would be better, perhaps, if they had released a non-collector's edition that wasn't necessarily um, a special edition and it didn't have the specialist packaging and everything and it was packaged in just a, a plain box? Um, yeah. With like a small bit. You know, like, um, was it the Series 4 cover, I think, of, of the original... Uh, of the, of the new series, yeah. yeah, the original cover, it was literally just the Doctor, Donna, and the Time Vortex, and it was a bit shiny. So if, if they released it in something separate so that maybe you could have um, yeah. a DVD version or something, do you think that perhaps would be better? Perhaps, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I want it re-released because I want it, and I don't want to, like, say goodbye. It's like a thousand pounds, so... Yeah. No. I mean, I did, I did actually see... I saw a box set totally complete for £48. Why I didn't think mm, it's worth just purchasing, I don't know. But I think for future reference, I mean, I don't want to be one of those people. I kind of thought, when I, when I was looking at the Peter Davison series, I was thinking, should I buy two of these? I mean, given what happened with the Tom ba first Tom Baker one, should I buy two so that I can sell another one? But actually I thought, well, then that's... that's you can't have a double standard because I thought, well... I, I wouldn't want somebody to hold on to this and then sell it as a massive profit. Yeah. So why why should I? I? I would be the kind of person who would go, oh, I missed it. Can you re-release it, please? Yeah. Or, I, I just thought, actually, that that's not... The the people who do that with the... Um, I think it's the... They're doing the B&M stores action figure box sets now. Yeah. But when, when they were coming out, I remember there being massive uproar because people were buying them like 50, 50 at a time and then selling them for about £100 per box. And everyone was going, you can't just let these people order 50 at a time and then sell them at massive profit because that's unfair on everybody. Yeah. Um, I don't know what happened in regards to that, but as far as I'm aware, like they, you saw the, uh, well, I hope you saw the uh, Sharda and Caves of Androzani sets that they released recently yeah. along with the Seventh Doctor and the War Doctor. Um, yeah. But apparently it's it's better now than it was before as in like people are having fair chance to buy them yeah you know speaking of figures like big finish like we're selling some of the bnm figures like character option figures that were based on their audios but they were slightly different pain taps so they're exclusives and they only had 50 of each set and you had to buy it in a three set bundle. Yeah. Like you got th all three sets in a like 60 quid bundle and it sold out within like half an hour. Yeah, that's I think that's that's the issue because I mean even within the Doctor Who fandom if you've got something like that and you've got people who are dedicated, you know, mm -hmm. the Who fandom dedicated yeah. with a capital D. Yeah. Um you will you will if something limited edition comes out, you'll find it very difficult to actually buy it unless yeah. you're you have you, you need to free up a whole day and then as soon as that thing is available you just gotta hit you've gotta press buy yeah or just wait for some for your local doctor who fan who has it to like pass away 
so you get the chance to get it, you know? That's an extremely dark way of looking at it. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a popular saying. Then if it's an easy competition, like, what's this character? Quickly go do it in the first two seconds that you have, and then go, and then you can win it, right? Yeah. <laughs> I I I mean I I was I was saying I was saying a popular saying just like the the only way you can get like good items to your collection is if your local Doctor Who fan dies. So oh yes, of course the old adage you can only get good quality figures if a local Doctor Who fan passes away. I, yes, my grandmother used to say that all the time. <laughs> the old saying within the is. <laughs> Is my yeah. is, is actually his so um, I've got to wait until he passes away. Mm. So we'll be Why wait? A long time then. He, he seems to be immortal. I actually, I'm a big fan of Ace Creeper. Mm. Um, and I, it's, it's George Sheard, isn't it? Um, I always yeah, get confused yeah. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. I think there's Ace Creeper and there's one other one, and they're very. I, I seem to remember them being quite similar, but I only watch George Sheard's now. Um, but I, I had the pleasure of talking to him um, because, as I mentioned before, I was at the cathedral when they were doing the filming and I actually managed to get some very nice 4K quality shots um, of Jodie Whittaker coming out and greeting the fans. Yeah. And I was like, look, I've got this footage, would you like it? And he was like, yeah, yeah, that'd be brilliant. I'm doing a video on it now. Um, and I was very happy that I actually managed to get some of my f um, videos featured in, uh, in one of his videos. He's a really nice guy and i love all of yeah. the videos he does yeah the, the, the good thing is I, I i don't live too far away from him so unless he's moved has he has he announced that he's moved somewhere because i remember remember i do remember like i think maybe i was talking last year or something like that and he was still they're probably in his, they're probably in the same place he might be this year i don't know i don't know i haven't really been i haven't really followed this because i didn't know so mm -hmm. yeah I haven't spoken to him ever. <laughs> yeah, oh, no, I've, I've yeah. spoken to him because I was uh, I wanted to do something, then uh, he, he was too busy to do it, yeah. so um, uh, he said no. But he, I do know um, where he lives. So <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, you, you know. I that's... think he's mm. he's one of the people in the Doctor Who, specifically the Who tubers. Um, he's one of the few that doesn't, I, I wouldn't say that he doesn't have an opinion, but he seems to take into account everybody else's opinion, which is, I think, a trait that lots more food fans should have, because, I mean, when, when people say to me, oh, I hated Series 11, oh, it was awful, you know, the story, Whitaker was terrible, you know, Chris Chibnall, he was, he was awful, he was a terrible showrunner, and you think... Oh, give him a chance, and then and then you see like one of George's videos come up, and he says he says the good and bad points, and I'm like, yeah, yeah he's measured, he's got his own opinion, but yeah. uh, he he has he has a way of, um, especially with like news and stuff, he he has a way of saying, okay, well this might be true, but wait until it's officially confirmed by the BBC, and I like that because there's yeah. there's few people that you you see now who will do that, but the fact that he does, um, I like that very much. Yeah, the only news stories we would actually cover on the Hooniversals would be officially, like, from the BBC, those yeah. are the news stories. Like, yeah. I remember back in the day, like, back in, I think, 2017, like, Ollie made a video covering the, the Mondasian Cybermen returning, yeah, but the thing is, it wasn't just that they were returning; they were flying. <laughs> so, he, like, because of the set reports, like they they were flat out flying, and as you saw in the episode, the Mondasian Cybermen were flying. <laughs> oh my god, he actually got it correct. Yeah, it's it's not like it was speculation. No, <laughs> you could see it in the photos; they were flying. <laughs> so yeah, and then later on that year. I think the first proper news video that was made was me, like, saying, Oh, look, the 13th Doctor is Jodie Whittaker. That's pretty exciting, isn't it? You know? I think the thing is that there is... Even now, there is such little release of information. And yeah. on one hand, it's a good thing, because it means that everything in the... Well, the majority of the things in the series are going to be a surprise. But I think 
it's different to how it used to be because, I mean, perhaps, I, I think it was um, John Nathan Turner who said that uh, sometimes the mind kind of spruces things up a bit after a little while. But I seem to remember there being a bit more information available as to the upcoming series. So, like, you would have, um, I don't think we've had an announcement of all of the, excuse me, we, I don't think we've had an announcement of all of the writers from this series yet, have we? Yeah, we no, like we've had we've had a couple of them confirmed, but that's yeah. confirmed by, I think the only uh, ones that base. have been confirmed. Uh, apparently, uh, Ed Ed Times, I think it is who wrote the "It Takes You Away" was confirmed like yeah. absolutely after the series eleven. Like yeah, people, people had still confirmed his uh, uh, his writing bio, and apparently he said Doctor Who two thousand and. Series twelve or something like that. And it was like, yeah, we know. He's yeah. Uh, yeah. So it, that uh, that's pretty by much. The, apparently, by the rumors, Peter Dick is going to uh, is writing. Apparently, uh, according to Kablam. Yeah. I think he is. Right. Obviously, we, William Wem. Right. We don't want to have too much blind speculation, but I mean, oh. we had. It seems to me that in the past we have had a lot more information. I mean, obviously we don't want spoilers, but I mean, at this point, they've had the majority of, I don't want to say the majority because obviously I'm not on the production team, I don't know, but apparently there has been a sufficient amount of footage done. That means that several episodes are completed or nearing completion. Oh yeah, and by, by August, they would, have, it, it, they would have started production in January at least. And Yeah, uh, you've got to have a, a select few done. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think at this point, the issue with these year breaks that we have, I mean, we had it, was it in 2016 or 2015? I can't quite remember. Uh, 2016. Yeah, yeah 2016. 2016, we had the year but gap. Even, even then, we had, like, they already were on production, like, they were doing series 10, and they were doing yeah. parts. The thing... So we, we, it, 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 it's, it's not as, as, as sufficient as this year, because apparently, like, if you hear a lot of people now, that are like, oh, 2016 was terrible, we only had one episode. No, we had parts. We, you, I, you know, it's... You know, it's all right or bad or whatever you call it. It was still eight episodes of something out. So that they yeah. Out. You have to... The issue is that you need to make sure that you keep Doctor Who alive. I mean, the fandom, we don't forget about it. We, we're always anticipating it. But the general yeah. public, they will go, oh, the new Doctor is Jodie Whittaker. Oh, it's a woman. Okay. And then they'll see Series 11 and they'll go, yeah, that was Series 11. And they probably won't think about it again. But if it's always on TV, and you see the adverts of it, obviously you get sick of it. So after we had Resolution, we should have had a couple of trailers saying Doctor Who Returns 2020, whatever. Um, yeah. Perhaps like a montage of stuff that had happened in Series 11, and then Doctor Who will return in 2020, have a bit of a gap, Yeah. and then when yeah, it what, gets what, to a what couple I of think, months... What I think should have been the exact right point, which they did last year, uh, Comic Con. They did a trailer at Comic Con. They unveiled that trailer for Series Eleven after about like seven months of like we didn't really hear that much. Yeah. And uh, which is the same as this year. So they should have done one at Comic Con. Yeah. We didn't get that. We didn't get anything. But I think uh, the hype. Yeah. Is kind of the hype isn't necessarily there for Series Twelve because it means that all of the stuff where we had you know what what's it going to be like with this new whole new dynamic, the new look, the new showrunner, the new writers, the new actors. Yeah. We've already got we, that now. Yeah, we've had that now, and I think in the public side they go, "Oh, so that was that," and then in then it, it's finished. It's not. It's not there anymore. If you keep it in people's minds, I mean, there are some adverts for things that they just get on your nerves. So you don't necessarily want to have something that's running all the time because that just drives people away. I mean, the amount of times that I've gone, "Oh, I've seen this a thousand times already. I don't need to see it again." If I see things a couple of times, I will actually think. Oh, that looks that looks pretty good. If you make something well and you do it at the right time, obviously it's difficult to gauge what is a good trailer and what is the right time. Yeah. But when you get that chemistry right, when it's a little bit after the series, so that you've had that cool down time, but then you can you can get your press out and you can say, oh, hype up series twelve a bit, and then it kind of it peaks and then it goes down a bit, and then further towards the series, you can say, okay, here's the actual trailer here's some of the things that might be happening and then you get people's interest again right yeah. up until yeah. the actual series airs and then I think 
pe- it, it's more in people's minds rather than people going away and then all of the Who fans come back for Series 12 because we care, but perhaps the general public don't necessarily care that much about watching the episodes because they've already seen what the dynamic is. Yeah. But then again, we didn't really have that during Series 11 as well, with like that, that sort of like, oh, well, oh, this trend, I've seen it before. Like, it, like back in the day, like, well, so back in the day, even like... In the Capaldi era, we can ancient get, like, history. A, a, yes, ancient history. The year, the year, year of two thousand five, six, seven, eight, whatever. Uh, well, I was going to say that, but then I was going to say actually, like even in the Capaldi year, like we kind of had uh, in twenty sixteen, we had like um, you know trailers to, to you know recognize that this is Doctor Who. This is yeah, yeah. We didn't have that. That was the problem. That was one of the, the apparent problems I had for series eleven is that we didn't because the we didn't have that kind of like ongoing sort of uh, it's uh, sort of, um, promotion during series eleven. I think the hype kind of died down. And that's why, like, why viewers kind of like uh, dropped. Yeah, because nobody was there was no trailers going like until I think it was at least until like resolution came out, and even then they kind of like half asked their trailers. Uh, at Christmas. Yeah. The, the oh, thing with Christmas. resolution was obviously trying to keep the Dalek. A secret, and obviously you had you had a new design, and that was I think what what perhaps not failed about the episode because I thought the episode yeah, was yeah. brilliant, but yeah. because you couldn't show the Daleks in the trailer because there was no trailer for Resolution, it kind of came mm-hmm. and went. And one of the reasons that I think the the rating the viewership dropped towards the end is the fact that they kept on changing the airing date. That was my problem because. If you have a show, you keep it on the same date every 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 time it airs. Yeah. Every Sunday, you have it on that particular time. Because I was every day, it, it came to Doctor Who Day, and I thought, right, okay, I'm going to be free from this time till this time. And I think, oh well, I've got a couple of yeah. minutes to spare, so I'll go out and do something, and I'll come back just in time to watch Doctor Who. But then. I come back and it's already halfway through the episode. That happened maybe five, six times. So over half of the times that I switched on to watch Doctor yeah. Who, I had to wait because I didn't want to miss the beginning and not know how the story was set up. Mm-hmm. So I would yeah. have to wait. And then I would be registered as the overnight figures. And I didn't want that. I wanted to be one of the people who helped to get it to the viewership on yep. the day. But you can't yeah. do that if you're somebody who doesn't necessarily have the radio times and obviously you can look it up online but i wanted to be able to watch doctor who at a specific time every day yeah which is what i think uh you know back in the day when they had those kind of trailers like saying uh you know next saturday it's it's 7 10 like i'm like oh yeah right okay 7 10 i've got that all sorted out i know what to do Uh, i've got all got everything else sorted out and then kind of they just didn't have that i think they had like maybe one or two like on the sunday that happened like you know saying like oh oh, next episode's on six o'clock or something like that and then you kind of forget for a while because you know because it's the end of the week again so you kind of have that end of the week kind of thing yeah it's like oh six o'clock seven o'clock eight o'clock yeah and that was stupid so the eight o'clock thing was probably yeah yeah that maybe might be a discussion for another time. But yeah. if there's one thing that they need to do for Series 12, it's have a, a, a consistent air date or air time. Yes. Yeah. That way you manage to keep people. If, if you've got somebody who's free one Sunday at that particular time, chances are you're going to have them free that time all the rest of the Sundays for the rest of the series. Because if you've got somebody who has a job who perhaps for some reason works Sundays you will have people who will be free from that time and they will always be free, not necessarily, but you think if if they're consistently free at least like eight times out of ten, you're going to be able to have a consistent viewership. And I think that that's one thing. I mean, even for, yeah. me, for me personally, having a consistent airtime would probably benefit the show um, for for the better. Yeah. I, I do feel like, although, yeah, that is true, I feel like it's more out of the show's control. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It has, to do with the, it has to do with the BBC schedules and that. Yeah. Like, they, can't, they can't predict what time the next programme could be put on. Uh, 
and then again, there are pushing back and pushing forward programs. Like I, I think I believe, uh, Strictly Come Dancing was it push back this year? Or was it I first think first it was. That's yeah. the, yeah, that's the kind is, of thing yeah, right. that people would blame on Chris Chibnall. Yeah, because not yeah, the, not saying that there, there's anything against just people who don't necessarily get um the ha, how it works but you you'll find that you'll have people who who say oh it's it's Chibnall's fault blame it on Chibnall blame it on Jody Whittaker yeah. but then you think that it's not in yeah. their hands they they're the people who make the show and try yeah. to make it as best as they think it can yeah. be and then they put it out it's not up to them when it goes out yeah. You know, yeah. they might have some say in whether or not it's a Saturday or the Sunday. You know, that the higher ups yeah. might sit down with Chris Chibnall and say, "Okay, well, we're going to try and do it on a uh, a Sunday, so it might be a slightly different audience. So cater for that in what you're doing." Mm-hmm. They would have sat down like months and months, maybe even a year before, to make sure that they got the chemistry right and they worked it out. But then the people who say, "Oh, yeah, but the viewers, it, it all, all, fall, all fell down, and it was because of." because of the air dates, you know, it's all very well me saying that, yeah. then actually saying to Chris Chibnall, you need to do this, and he goes, well, I'm not a miracle worker, I can't just magic a time time slot out of the sky and say, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll cater to exactly your every whim. Uh, I think people yeah. perhaps need to see past the fact that Chris Chibnall is new. And we've had this time and time again when the show came back and the, the show was leaked um, on online. You know, people hated it and people were saying, oh, Christopher Eccleston, Billy Piper, it's all wrong, everything's rubbish. Oh, I remember yeah. when the classic series was there. I remember when it was in black and white. Bring back Bill Hartnell. It's, you can say that or you can go, okay, just take the rough with the smooth and see what happens rather than blindly hating it because it's something that's new mm-hmm. and that's something that we need to I, I think address next time is we have to go okay it's something new let's just see what it's like before we start hating it I usually start over loving it when it's new and then I well I say usually series 9 no <laughs> but you know like it's not that I'm always positive, it's just like, usually when it's new and it's not terrible, I'm just like, I'm enjoying this. Because, you know, yeah. it's Doctor Who, I'm, in, I'm enjoying this, it's a, it's a good show, you know? After Jodie Whittaker was announced, I remember, I remember exactly where I was, I was in my living room, I had to sit through half an hour of tennis because I didn't know when the news was going to be on, because obviously it kept getting pushed back and pushed back. Sat through half an hour of tennis, then the news. And then the one thing that irritated with me about the Jodie Whittaker reveal is that they had her face behind before they were announcing who it was. So they had Jodie Whittaker's face behind the presenter and she said, and now the moment you've all been waiting for, the next doctor is, and then they went into the clip and you go, oh, so it was the woman who was behind you. Okay, no, that's fair. But when she was announced, I yeah. kind of thought, oh, I, don't, I don't really know if... This is what I'd like. I don't really know. What... I was against it initially, but then after a while, I kind of and and the costume pictures came out and the pictures of you know the new TARDIS exterior. I thought actually I began to think of nobody else but Jodie Whittaker as the Doctor. And then when yeah. it came up to like the the hype for Series Eleven, I thought, what am I doing? I love Doctor Who, whatever it is, whatever form it is. I mean, yeah. okay. Perhaps the twin dilemma wasn't the best story, but I still sat through it, you know, because I love the show. And if people love the show, if people want a new iteration of the show to be there, everyone who goes, I'm not watching this series, it's not fair, it's not what I want. And then people don't watch it, despite the fact that they don't know what it's going to be like. They don't know whether or not it's actually going to be good. Yeah. Give it a try then they're essentially dooming their favourite show. Whether or not you like this iteration or not, it doesn't matter. If you watch it and you don't like it, that's okay. You can have an opinion. But if you don't watch it and say you don't like it, it's like when people say, oh, I don't like that food. No, oh, I don't like, like broccoli. Have you ever had yeah. broccoli? No, but I know I don't no, like no, it because it's green. Like it. 
So yeah. people should grow up, basically, is what you're saying. I mean, to put it bluntly, yeah. But but people, you know, should I think wait until they've seen it, and even if they don't like it, they should be able to go, okay, I am in. I I don't enjoy these episodes. But if I want the show to carry on and be something that I do like, I have to actually watch the show and I have to say, yeah, okay, I like it. After after you've had all of the bits that you don't like, at some point you will get to the bit where you do like it. And the yeah. only reason that that show will be around is because you have stuck with it. And that's the thing that people need to see and go, yeah, actually, you know what? Perhaps I will just give it a go. And then when it comes to the series that I actually do like, I, I, w I will like it. Because you won't know whether or not you like it if if you go, oh, I won't watch Jodie Whittaker's next series either. I didn't watch the first series. I, I won't know what's going on. And then you watch the second and you don't watch the second series. I mean, if a new showrunner comes about, how will you know that it's any different from the show that came before? So yeah. you need to have at least a frame of reference to go, okay, I didn't like this iteration of the show, but I do like this brand new one that's different from the last one and the one before that and the one before that. Yeah. And then you can actually build up an appreciation for the series that you do like. Big Finish has gone through its own set of dramas recently, and I'm not yeah. just speaking about the sets. Um, the, the one that I feel personally attached to is the fact that the Companion Chronicles are now going out of print, and I'm like, I want more of them, but they're going out of print. I did actually hear a couple of the Companion Chronicles, and I I have to say I did enjoy them. Um, I liked there was, was it the Dalek Occupation of Winter? I was listening to that's, the free one. And that's an early adventure, not a Companion Chronicle. I'm not, I'm not in totally sure on all of my big finish release uh, titles, but I mean, e even that but one, perhaps it isn't the Companion Chronicles, but uh, the ones that I have heard, it, it felt similar, because I think it was Peter Purvis was doing the voice of the first Doctor as yeah. well, and it felt so true. I love the Dalek Occupation occupation of winter i thought it was such a good episode yeah uh, i really want to listen to it. it it sounds good i i'm a bit of a cheapskate so i only watched uh, sorry i only listened to the free one that i yeah. managed to download at some point um and i listened to it and i thought this this is this is now um i can't even remember what i'm saying About the Dalek yeah. Opera. Sorry, yeah. I've completely lost my train of thought. Um, Dark Occupation of Winter. Yes. Oh yeah. Sorry. Um, it actually made me think. I would. I would definitely spend money on this because some of the episodes that they they put for free, I I think yeah, it's all right. But when it came to the Dalek op Occupation of Winter, um, I thought no, I, I really like this. This is this is something that I could quite happily watch. Um, Uh, it, it's something I could quite happily listen to yeah. um, for the, for the whole story. So I enjoyed I enjoyed um, listening to it. So if it's something that you're interested in listening to, I would definitely give at least the first go. Um, yeah. I would at least give give the first episode a go because it's it's a good it's a good story and um, Peter Purvis's impersonation of the first Doctor is is very good. Um, yeah. It does it does sound like Peter Purvis, but he's he's got his mannerisms down very yeah. very well. And I think that's the most important part about doing an impersonation of a doctor. Like if you don't have the mannerisms down, I'm sorry, I don't believe you as that doctor. I don't believe you as that character. Full stop. Because like with Peter Purvis, I have heard him in other audios, um, like some well some other companion chronicles, and he's really good as the first doctor and. Yeah, and quite frankly, Maureen O'Brien, I I bought her as the first Doctor. Really? Yeah, it's it's like it's like it's because she was getting mannerisms down, and although you can tell, okay, it's not the first Doctor. It's like still, you can picture, okay, the first Doctor is there in that story. Yeah, and that's the most important thing. Um. So yeah. But I, I would say Fraser Hines as the second Doctor, 
is is something else. Because, right, so you know how Peter Purvis is really good as the first Doctor, but still yeah. sounds like Peter Purvis? Fraser Hines sounds like Patrick Troughton, or as close as you can get. Really? Yeah, he is really kind of does. Like Chris, Chris Walker Thompson quality. I would say they're good at different parts of the second Doctor. Chris Walker Thompson's better at the more higher pitched end of Pat's range, yeah. whilst um, whilst Fraser Hines, he's better at like everything else. Like I can picture the second to, Doctor. Yeah, like um, it's different to spending lots of time with somebody. Um, and picking up all of the things because you're you know them intimately. I mean, yeah. It, obviously, Fraser Hines would have. He was. I think he was one of the. He, he was one of the companions that had more stories than any others. I think. Yeah. Don't quote me on that one, but I think. But I mean, you spend that much time with somebody, and obviously watching them in character, you're bound to at least pick up a lot of the mannerisms, the things they do, the kind of the intonations in their voice. It's it's like how you can tell that somebody isn't somebody when they're trying to impersonate someone like on the end of a phone or something. You can hear the differences because they haven't quite got it down. And if you're looking at people's different writing styles, you can see that there's definite differences between this person and somebody who's trying to imitate that person. Yeah. Um, so obviously Fraser Hines doing Patrick Troughton. I mean, I wouldn't have had him down as somebody who would do like a spot on impression of Patrick Troughton. But obviously Chris Walker Thompson, he hasn't, known Patrick Trout and he's just seen all of the yeah all of the episodes and the audios and everything so he he will under, have an understanding of the voice but not necessarily of the person and I think um, the person is 50% of the voice yeah but even still like Chris Walker Thompson and Fraser Hines they're not literally Patrick Troughton but they're as close as you can get with Bill Hartnell there's a lot of good impersonators out there but with John Pertwee there's a few good ones, like, like the th the thing is, if you're gonna get an impersonator for certain characters, then the all you need to do is have as good as possible, and like all you need to do is that is have those actors like sell that they are that character. Like Pete Walsh as the Ninth Doctor sounds more like the Ninth Doctor than Chris Eccleston does. Yeah, I, the, <laughs> like. Yeah, perhaps I, I was saying like um, fifty percent of the voice is the person. Perhaps it's more like split three different ways. Um, perhaps it's more that you've got fifty percent the person, twenty five percent the voice, and twenty five percent the the performance. Because yeah. I mean, if if you there's a difference between playing a character and playing so like Bradley. Um, Brad. Uh, David Bradley, David Bradley yeah. when he was playing, when it was uh, 2013 in an adventure in space and time, obviously he was playing William Hartnell, but then he was playing William Hartnell playing the Doctor. Yeah. Um, so there was a difference. You could see a clear difference between when he was playing William Hartnell mm -hmm. and when he was playing William Hartnell being the first Doctor, and he kind of got it down, I think. I mean, the voice wasn't necessarily there, but yeah. the actual performance of him was there. Um, I don't see that. I see kind of his performance in adventures sort Ooh. of like it, compared to the one in twice by the time but it's sort of like he's only doing it for the first time it's like his first it obviously probably was his first time he hadn't really been able to do this before but it's like it it, it shows, shows, shows yeah. I, you could see that he was when he was playing bill hartnell if you look at um twice upon a time in an adventure in space and time you can see um, the differences between because in 2017 he was actually playing the first doctor he was playing that character but in an adventure yeah. in space and, a, and time he was playing a real person playing a character and so there's a different there's there's two extra layers so on one you've only got one layer where you're just playing the character so perhaps that's why people thought that his performance was maybe off but i actually don't think it was i think he was portraying the first doctor I don't think necessarily he was trying to do the same thing he did in an adventure in space and time because in an adventure in space and time, he had two layers. So he had two things to think about and two people to think about William Hartnell and the doctor. I mean, for most people, they will see them as one and the same, but for yeah. David Bradley, he had to make sure that he could 
find the difference between the two. So where's the separation between Bill Hartnell and the Doctor? And actually, for a lot of the time, um, William Hartnell and the Doctor were the same person because, I mean, as you saw in the documentary, you know, depending on how true to life that is, you could see that actually he was essentially the Doctor all the time. And he yeah. loved it. And even when he was in The Three Doctors, you could see he was clearly enjoying being able to be in that part once again. Yeah. Um, and you can see that coming across in his performance. So, continuing on, I mean, I guess, like, the way... I don't know, like... Because David Bradley does Big Finish as the first Doctor, and now he's the de facto mm. first Doctor actor, which is weird. Um, yeah. I can see doing an adventure in space and time and uh, 2017's Twice Upon a Time. I can understand why they do that, because they do look strikingly similar. But when it came to the audios, the first Doctor audios, and they cast David Bradley, I kind of thought, I can kind of see why. Because he's kind of, the dis as you say, the definitive first Doctor now. For a generation of people, that's their first Doctor. But when it comes to the audios, I kind of, I would have thought that they would have had a William Hartnell impersonator for the first Doctor audios, mm -hmm. and obviously yeah. ones for Ian and Barbara, and maybe even have William Russell come back to play um, in Chesterton. But I, I think that having impersonators playing the characters would probably have been a better choice than David Bradley. I mean, not knocking his performance, I think when he is playing the first Doctor and whether when he's playing... William Hartnell, uh, he is fantastic. But yeah. in terms of doing the audios, I think I would probably prefer to hear... Um, I'm, I'm doing quotation marks here. I'd probably prefer to hear William Hartnell's voice, if you know what I mean. Yeah. But I did end up listening to one of the audios, and actually, it was really good, and it was immersive. But perhaps what they should have done is done it like one of the unbound ones so they had perhaps an alternate first doctor um i, I don't know how but I, I think that probably would would have worked more in the context of doing the audios rather than not having an impersonator yeah and also like i've only heard him in an actual production once but if i said what it was it would actually kind of be a spoiler like, to the actual production itself. So I won't say what it is, because it's a surprise, but it, it feels... It th to be honest, I think I kind of have to spoil it to explain my point. This uh, is a spoiler alert. If you don't want the... Uh, if you don't want the spoiler, you have to skip ahead. I'm sure we'll provide a time code or something. I probably won't, to be fair. This thing's too long as it is, but I might. Because, you know, I'm editing this anyway. Um, but yeah, so, The Legacy of Time. Um, I mean, I said it in my review, but I gave a time skip for that. Yeah. Spoiled it for me. Yeah, The Legacy of Time. Like, the final episode has, like, a moment where, like, the climax is all the Doctors that had adventures in that set all come together and pilot the first TARDIS to make sure time doesn't mess up. Right. Yeah, it's very fan fiction-y, pretty much. But then, another like a TARDIS materialises in that very first TARDIS, like the very first TARDIS ever, not oh God, the Doctor not the time TARDIS. Oh monster again. No, but this... this... I was thinking of... Uh, I was thinking of um... <laughs> Sorry, the Goblis. Yeah, but like, an yeah, another TARDIS lands in, and then like... Benny and Leela walk in, and, like, they're greeted by the 10th Doctor in his console room, and then just in that TARDIS you also see, like, the 1st Doctor and the 2nd Doctor, as played by David Bradley and Fraser Hines, respectively, and the difference is, like, night and day, it's just, like, you, they, they, their performances for their respective actors couldn't be, like, so jarringly different, because it's, like, sure, David Bradley has the mannerisms, so on screen... I was sold that, yes, I'm watching the first Doctor. Although, my, um, the illusion was broken by the writing. Oh, Let's God. Let's go there, shall we? Yeah, let's not go there. I had to review that bloody thing. Because I was like, I want to review a Christmas special. I regret that. I'm thinking of, I'll 
I'll take over if I'm if I come over for another year. Yeah. Unless if any, unless if anyone else has had dibs on it, which I don't think they did. Maybe I did Nick. Dislike, I'd like to point out, I did not dislike Twice Upon a Time. I actually thoroughly enjoyed that episode. However, some brief moments in that episode were things that I did indeed dislike, and that's something that doesn't happen often. So, yes, a little bit disappointing, but it's fine because I thought it was a good episode overall. That's my comment. That's it. I'm a Twice Upon a Time apologist, and I think the episode was terrible. <laughs> well, not terrible, just like four out of ten, I would say now. Um, I would say I'd say six out of ten. Like it, the only thing that strikes me wrong is the humor. Like their attempts at humor aren't funny, to be honest. But I feel like it in places it is a bit heartwarming. I feel like it it is really Capaldi for last episode in in a way. Like you, the Doctor Falls didn't in a way was, but then yeah. I feel like this is his last episode and sort of. But I don't think it was like Bradley's as well. So. Yeah, and um, the the um, the fact that it has no plot really just kind of drives me up the walls. While, but oh, I didn't mind it. The oh, most and, jarring and, and, and the reused reused soundtrack. That's probably one of my big gripes about it. You know? I like the reused soundtrack, to be honest. Well, I do feel like if it was it was Mojo's real life, like if it was his real last one, then he should have gone out and like scored a lot more than he did and. Talking about the regeneration, he reused the series four track, and I'm thinking like, well, I would we should have got Sagan in at that point. I don't know if they probably uh, uh, got him in at that point, uh, but they, I would have should have got Sagan in to do like. There was there was a video on YouTube or Twitter, I can't remember which, um, in which somebody had actually put the Thirteenth Doctor's theme over the bit after the regeneration so you've got Jodie Whittaker and it does fit perfectly well I think that it it could have benefited from having the 13th Doctor's theme over the top and then Segan take it it would have felt more like a transition yeah and something slightly more different because obviously you could tell kind of that the cinematography had changed slightly but when it came to that last that last part, I think, definitely they should have had uh, Segan in to do um, yeah. his bit of the track. But I mean, overall, I think the episode was fine. The one jarring thing that I had with it was how you had twelve and one. They meet and they're like, "Oh, you're regenerating. I don't know who you are, but I'm regenerating." Look. Have you come to take the ship away? Oh, you still call it the ship. All of a sudden, snow stops. Something's very wrong with time. How do you know? How do you know that something is extremely wrong with time? How? Time lords. It just yeah. happened. All of the snow just froze at that moment for no reason. It feels like there should have been more of an explanation, as in, like, um, the gl perhaps the glass people should have been like, there's a temporal disturbance and it's affected our, I don't know, a little bit of exposition to explain. Or, or some like or something to say like, you know, the first doctor here, you know, isn't the proper first doctor, so he kind of steals a couple of the like uh, you know, the the like the latest stuff that you know the twelfth doctor would have. Um maybe that would also actually, you know, fix up the uh, the um <clears throat> big problems with his uh character like yeah if it wasn't the like if it did a Richard Herndl to me honest, I don't mind if there is a Richard Herndl but they are doing a Richard Herndl but I mean like sort of like he's it, it it's it you sort of trick it into it's knowing it's the kind of first doctor I think there's that shot in like the end near the end of the episode where like the glass uh, uh the testimony well I know it's the testimony uh, the last person um, uh, is doing that kind of scary thing with a uh, doctor, and I thought, actually, does this mean that the doctor's fake? And that kind of, you know, works into the way of that's not even a character. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but there it wasn't. There are some fan theories that can explain the strange behaviour, but yeah, this kind of turned into a review. It went from, let's not go there to. Let's oh, explore it in detail. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I'm just like, 
it's just an average story, mainly it mainly due to the lack of plot, but it's knocked down a peg because, oh my gosh, the first Doctor was written horribly, so therefore it is a 4 out of 10. I did it mathematically. Done. Give me my maths degree already. <laughs> Can I pose a question, actually, on the subject of the first Doctor? Yeah. Well, perhaps not a question, but perhaps a talking point. Um, fairly recently, as in, in the last couple of months, there were a selection of tapes discovered named the Randolph tapes um, that were denoted, donated to the company Kaleidoscope of lots of missing episodes of Doctor Who. Recently, they were, they were looked at by Mark Ayres, the person now who would Does usually the... remaster the um, sound of all of the class classic episodes, and I think he's worked on a couple of the newer ones as well. Yeah. But he took a listen to them, and I've heard some clips of some of them, and they sound like they were ripped straight off the master tape. And I don't know what your position is on missing episodes, but... Um, mm -hmm. Would you perhaps like to see more animated episodes, or do you think that we should um, focus on doing like uh, like remakes of the episodes using the original soundtrack? I, and I think I prefer the animated episodes. Yeah, they've, they've they've gotten they've gotten better, obviously, and I feel like yeah, you know, I've, I've watched the Macro Terror, and uh, but I've never actually you know, well, of course, I haven't watched the. Re like the um, telly slaps or the the audio version of Macro Terror, and already I kind of feel like, oh yeah, this is probably the second Doctor story that it would have been at the time, and that and I just feel like you know if we can stop that and do something else, I feel like maybe we won't kind of you know maybe the, the I, I don't know I just I just feel like you know if we stop that and just do kind of proper remakes, it would you know. It would it, it would stop a lot of uh, good work being done to the animated uh, versions. Uh, yeah. Hello. Yeah. I think I think the one thing I'd like to see is like two like animated stories per year. Even though they probably wouldn't be able to do that, I just feel like you know, I just feel like maybe like having one kind of like stops. Like, yeah. Thing. I just yeah. think I just think that maybe like two a year would probably be. Me. So we were talking about the collection box sets earlier on. Yeah. Um, so it looks like we're going to get the whole of the classic series on these box sets. But when it comes to having the earlier series, specifically William Hartnell and Patrick Troughton's series, um, we obviously some are missing. So there's some animation. But also um, the majority of the episodes that we have found from that era were tele recordings, um, literally pointing a 16 millimeter film camera at a TV screen, syncing it up and then recording the episode over two or three film cans. Now, people are saying, well, because they are only versions that have been recorded off the TV screen, they can't be like true HD quality. But do you think, because, because they are 16 millimeter film prints, it means that you can actually have 1080p scans of them and they will be at the same quality, um, kind of pixel for pixel, that Spearhead from Space was in when it was put on Blu-ray. So, it, I mean, just just out of curiosity, do you think you would prefer to see them um, like the original tape quality, but scanned from the 16 millimeter print, or do you think perhaps it would be better if we just keep it as the standard definition and kind of upscale it? Why not both? Why not have like the off-screen recordings like a uh, DVD extra? Yeah, I I suppose that would work because yeah, it, unless you really want to see something like you know all the stories in like an off-screen recording on 1080p, yeah, that would that would excite you. But then again, you can't watch it somebody else record. Well, the, these 60 millimeter recordings are ones done by the BBC, so these are the ones that have been found in. Um, an array of strange places but these are the only obviously the the only visual record that we have of these stories um, so yeah they do deserve to be on there in some capacity yeah so whether or not we we, we re-scan these episodes at 1080p because obviously it, that's the um, resolution that we're, we're watching the blu-rays at so do you think that they should be scanned at those quality 
that quality and then perhaps upscale further or do you think that the, the quality that they're in is fine I honestly don't mind the quality in Classic Who. I'm just getting the Blu-rays because they look pretty. <laughs> uh, like, but also it's just like it's an easy way to like fill up my collection because I was like, oh, I I don't own half of season nineteen and I don't own yeah. most of season eighteen. Oh look, collection filled. Yeah, that. I was gonna say earlier that was my problem of really getting the collections. Even though this is going off tangent, but when the season twelve collection was announced, I was like. I was literally getting Revenge of the Cybermen. I was thinking, oh, wait, that's my collection now gone. And then now I've got 18, 19. And now I just feel like, and 23. I, the only one I don't have is 10. But then again, I could literally try and find like you know, one of those. So I do feel like, you know, for some people, it, it is a bit of a nuisance when like you, they've announced one and then you're like, oh, but I've already got a DVD. Do I need to get it in Blu-ray? I'm enjoying the fact that I've already got some of these on DVD yeah. because it means I can either sell them on e eBay or I can take them down to CEX and exchange them for something else on Blu-ray. Yeah. So I, I think for, for the majority of people, it, it might actually be a good thing because on the one hand, yes, you've spent all of this money um, over a long period of time buying your entire collection, but then you think, well, actually, if I can see it in better quality... Um, yeah. If you've got some rare releases, like uh, I was in CEX the other day and I found the original first ever Doctor Who DVD and it was the Five Doctors Special Edition. Oh, and sweet. I saw the original and I thought, do you know what? Someone would probably pay a lot for this. And then I went and bought well, actually, Macro Terror actually, instead. I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you this. Uh, it's in the 50p aisle, actually. Okay. I'm not kidding. I literally searched up like... Because usually, usually when I know I'm going to go to CEX the next day, like tomorrow, as I am, I'm going to go tomorrow. Um, I usually do the job for like Doctor Who uh, like releases, and I, I was looking through, and I saw the five, uh, the original Five Doctors DVD, and it was being sold for fifty p. So yeah, it, it's. Yeah. I think um, if you find the right person, they'll pay the right price. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, really, really, there's a couple of original releases I want. Like, that's the original Three Doctors release from, like, 2003 with Messi. That, that, oh, I've seen yeah. That, I've seen that. And I, I, just, I just wanted Messi. That's what I really need. Um, yeah. But the, the thing about the collections is, like, uh, what, uh, one thing that also turns me off about the collections is, uh, apparently, like, this is, this is uh, brought up in... Um, Mr. Tons' uh, season ten unboxing video, which was a great video, by the way. That was a great, <laughs> it was a great dark humor uh, video. Um, like some of the documentaries from the DVDs are really, uh, like missing on the Blu-rays, and I feel like, yeah, right. Do I need to? Throw, I should. Should I? Throw, and those people who are thinking, oh, should I throw away the DVDs if I got the Blu-rays? Well, you shouldn't, because there's a couple of documentaries like um, on those DVDs that are you know, on the Blu-rays, and I, I do feel like, like with the Blu-rays having more with them, they're probably going to also have to take out a lot of stuff from the originals, and I, I do feel like, yeah, that's probably the, one of the reasons why I don't want to get the Blu-rays, because I feel like, you know, if if there's like one, if there's like this one big documentary that's been sitting around, I'm sorry, I'm getting called on, getting called on Messenger, um, sorry for that, uh, edit this out now, um, mm. uh, it, it's like, you know, there's that one big documentary on, you know, say, uh, the Tribal Time Lord, um, and they don't include it in the Blu-ray, and I'm thinking, right, I've wasted my money, um, <laughs> sorry, I've wasted my money on, like, this collection, even though I could have just, like, watched that, like, um, especially on the original, and, uh, to be honest, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the TVs now and, uh, devices will upscale your DVDs for, 720, 1080, but they won't do it on the Blu-ray, and I feel like maybe that, that could be another reason why people are, like, turned off. Will you stop calling me? I can I can see why um, why people wouldn't want to have these um, episodes on Blu-ray and why perhaps upscaled stuff isn't necessarily what people are looking for, but I mean, I... I, I can't remember which one I watched. Um, I watched an episode 
I, 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 that's right. It was my lost oh, in uh, time. Sorry, Matt. I'm good. I'm sorry, guys. I'm just gonna have to leave because this person was not won't stop calling me until I actually leave this call. So, okay. Bye. Sorry. Don't worry. It's okay. Yeah. But Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Seeing the original episodes um, in that quality, I, I can see the difference. It was my Lost in Time DVD box set, and then it was it was one of my season ten episodes, and uh, it might have been Frontier in Space. And watching them next to each other, I actually thought I can definitely tell the difference in quality here. And yeah. I think it's that jump from four eighty p to ten eighty that I, I I definitely buy into and. I would much, because I, I never really had much of a collection in terms of my classic series DVDs, I've got the majority of the new series, but when it came to the classic series, I, I just kind of, I would go into HMV or CEX and I'd go, oh, there's a couple of those, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll buy that one because I wanted to, I was interested, like I had the, uh, obviously the Lost in Time box set, um, and I had the... Oh, what was it called? I think it was just called The Collection. Um, and it was 30 Years in the TARDIS and it was Sharda. Yeah. Um, and that was one of the one of the ones that I kind of, I was interested in because I, I'd never seen Sharda. Obviously at this point we've got at least like three or four different versions of Sharda. Yeah. I, I bought it and I was interested. And again, I... I had the Sharda animated version, and I can definitely see the difference between the two. Um, and I would much prefer, I think, to watch my Blu-rays rather than my DVDs. And for me, because I don't necessarily have as many classic series DVDs, um, it means that I, I'm not really missing out on much in terms of the DVDs. So I'm quite happy to hand over. I mean, the BBC own my bank account, so they can like withdrawal as much as they want as long as they keep sending me dvd box sets or blu-ray block box sets so i mean i'm pretty sorted in um in terms of that but i mean i can see why other people would opt out of having the dvd box sets yeah i mean personally i think well the season 10 one specifically but like I, th I think the box sets are worth it alone for behind the sofa and the reason why I say season 10 specifically is because Phil Collinson is hilarious. Yeah, He's... I season 10 is, is shaping up to be uh, a good season. I've been trying to watch them in order because the other two, I didn't watch them in order. But this time, I have actually um, watched them in order. And I'm glad of it because it means that it makes much more sense. But um, yeah, yeah, I think it's a brilliant I mean, with season 19, I haven't bothered binging it, and with season 18, I tried binging it, and just after Meg lost, I was just like, I can't be bothered with this. Yeah. Then, yeah, because it's season 18. I mean, I then watched Full Circle, then the rest of them eventually, but I skipped Keeper of Traken because I was just like, I've seen this before, and I hated it because it was so boring. So, yeah, I was just like, no. I'm not going to watch Keeper of Trakan, but I'm going to watch Logopolis with the new CGI effects. Mm, I, I and that was interesting. This, I, I've never once not enjoyed an episode of Doctor Who. That's something where people have say, oh, what's your favourite? What's your least favourite? Who's your favourite Doctor? I, mm. I have never, not once, watched an episode of Doctor Who and gone, that was rubbish. I hated that. And not once have I ever said to anybody, this is my least favourite Doctor. I don't know what it is, but I just, I never have. Hmm. Like, I personally, like, of course we all have our different opinions, but I personally, like, the, the typical episode of Doctor Who I'll, I'll enjoy, but there's like an odd few that I'm just like, nah. I mean, in the modern series, um, like, in, like, not even 2005 onwards, more like 2006 onwards, because Series 1, close to perfection. Oh, yeah. But, like, like most of the modern series, I'm I'm just like... Well, not most of the modern series, but it's more frequent in the modern series where I'm just like, eh, is, is this... But even then, I'm just more, like, I'm more ambivalent than outright don't like. It was actually more in the Moffat era. Not exclusive to the Moffat era, mind you, just 
it happened a lot more in the Moffat era than it did in like probably all of Classic Q. I for me have I I have less of an impulse. I don't get up in the morning and I think, oh, I know what I'd like to do. I know what I'll do. I'll go up and get whatever it is episode, or I'll watch whatever it is episode. Yeah. Um, from the new series, I'm much more. Perhaps it's my own curiosity about the original series, but it's it, it's something where I think, well, actually, I I would I would like to watch a classic series episode, perhaps because it's something a little bit different to what we used to, or. But I, I've always kind of thought, yeah, I I like this. I would prefer to watch a classic series episode than a new series episode. I think personally, I'm just more invested in the like classic Who style, just and the Doctors and like all the monsters, and I'm more invested in those than the new series. But it's not like I'm not I'm not invested in the new series. If I yeah. absolutely forced myself to watch a new series story, I would love it. But yeah. I. But if I didn't force myself, I wouldn't watch it. Like, I had to force myself to watch the Human Nature two-parter at one point. And I was just like, I really enjoyed this. There was no reason for me not to enjoy this. Same thing with Waters of Mars. I was just like, actually, one time I was just like, I actually fancy watching Waters of Mars. I watched it, and I loved it. Because it's the Waters of Mars. Yeah. Like, you know me. exactly. Like, oh, I'm just in love with like there's there's certain episodes like e even if even if I'm less into a doctor like David Tennant I'm not a fan of the 10th doctor like well I like his doctor like especially now he's on big finish I really appreciate like okay he's likable but I don't love him I don't actually get his doctor like, I get why people like him, but I don't get why people say, oh, he's the best, he's the best. I'm just like, mm. well, it's either nostalgia, or you think he's the prettiest, which he's not. Colin Baker and Paul McGann are prettier. <laughs> uh, Paul McGann, yeah. I think you'll find, is the winner out of those two. Have you seen the photos of Colin Baker from the 70s? Yes, I have. However, I will stick to my guns and say, Paul McGann all the way. But like I say, that's my own personal uh, opinion. I mean, Paul McGann is probably prettier, but let's face it. I mean, Colin. Colin is the Don. You can't beat that coat. <laughs> oh, oh, yes, you can't. You really can't. Best Doctor outfit. I'm not even kidding. I, I, I love it, unironically. I, I find with his outfit that, obviously, yes, it is a costume, but... It, it's not. It's not that much of an issue for me. I think when watching the episodes, I I just I deal with it. I, I haven't actually seen all that much Sixth Doctor. I'll be honest with you, but when I do have it, or when I do watch it, I think, eh, it's not that bad. It's it's fine. It's not. It's garish. Yes. Yeah. But, it's not, but so is the Doctor. So it doesn't matter. Yeah. I mean, See, that's another thing. The the TV movie. Um, I was involved in a discussion on Twitter, where else, um, not so long ago, about the Doctor Who TV movie. Mm -hmm. Now, again, I, I'm a bit of a tech buff, so when it comes to Doctor Who, I am fascinated with the missing stuff um, from the whole, the whole of the eras. I mean, people might be thinking, well, surely 1996, there can't be anything missing, but in fact, there is. There is. And it is the original 35mm film from the recording of the episode. Uh, I say yeah. episode of the movie. Now, this is this stuff isn't missing. This stuff exists. Um, I, I don't have the authority or the knowledge to say definitely what does exist and what doesn't. However, I am aware that there are pre-screener copies. I have got a pre a bit of a pre-screener copy um, on my. Google Drive, um, it was sent to me by somebody who had mm. um, a pre-screener copy. Um, but the actual original 35mm film, when it came out on Blu-ray, everyone was anticipating it to be high quality, yeah. 35mm, you know, people were thinking, this is going to be good. And then they put it in the disc, as I did, 
and they put it in the player and they switch it on and they, they have a menu and they go, oh, this is going to be so cool. You switch it on and... Just looks the same. Just, yeah. In fact, I actually think it looks worse than the DVD release. And it's because the upscaling technique that they've used has butchered some of the fine detail. And I think it actually softens the image too much rather than sharpens it up. And the reason for that is because it's the same master tape that's been used since it was first broadcast in 1996. And obviously with some of the earlier episodes of Doctor Who, you can accept that. But from something with something from 1996 that was actually shot in 35 yeah. millimeter film, you know, you think, well, come on, surely you can, surely you can find the film. And as far as I'm I aware, think the issue with it like why you can't properly upscale it not because you can't find the film but because it's i think it's the cgi that they used because yeah. the cgi was not high definition like the film the cgi yeah. was standard definition because that's the tvs they were broadcasting for yeah so when when they did it they insisted on editing it and doing all the cgi on tape which in principle is fine because if it's just i mean let's face it i mean doctor who it had a several million pound budget in 1996, but it wasn't it wasn't exactly like the new Star Wars at that point. Yeah. So it, it had I think it had five million, but you can correct me on that if you like. Um, I think it, it had a budget of five million pounds of dollars, um, and they they shot it on 35, and apparently one of the reasons that they couldn't rescan it for its Blu-ray release was because of difficulty getting hold of the film. Now that would suggest that the film actually still exists. But like you say, the actual the CGI was not done on film. It was done on the tape. Now one thing I kind of thought was, well surely if you can if you're prepared to upscale a standard definition tape movie and release it on Blu-ray and say glorious HD when really it, it, it isn't, then I would have thought that actually, I mean, if, if you've got the budget to rotoscope loads and loads of footage from uh, when they did oh, Turlo's first episode, was, it, was that Terminus? Uh, Turlo's it? first episode was Mordron Undead. Yeah, I think it was Mordron Undead. Um, the, the people who were doing the um, additional CGI, they had spent ages rotoscoping and rotoscoping and rotoscoping um, all of the edges of the Black Guardian and Turlo when he's... In that spirally thing. Yeah, yeah. So surely if they have the budget to do that, I would have thought that they would be able to rotoscope um, upscaled footage from the original master tape of all of the CGI and then they could put that over the top of the scanned 35 millimeter film. I would have thought it wouldn't look too bad, um, but obviously there's loads of logistical issues behind the scenes that we don't know about. But um, in terms of the, the TV movie having another release, I mean, is that something you'd like to see? What I would like to see is like, personally, I would prefer like having new CGI for the TV movie right. for the release. Um, whether that be its own creative li liberties or trying to stay true to the original but make it so that you can have it in HD. Yeah, I, I think there's, there's been a lot of fan attempts recently as well. Um, I saw a couple of title sequence recreations that were trying to yeah. stay close, but um, they, they were kind of trying to take a little bit of an artistic liberty to make it look a bit better. I mean, Something they've done with the with the classic series is for a couple of I think Peter Davison episodes they have cropped it to sixteen by nine. Do you think they should do that with the TV movie if it is rescanned, or do you think that it's it's perhaps something that's best left? I don't like it when people try and make things in a different aspect ratio to what they originally were, especially now we've got. TV, the perfect, you know, TV screens to have any aspect ratio in it not looking dodgy, yeah. you know. It's just like, what's the point of having a worse looking 16 by 9 image when you can have a decent looking 
four by three image layer. I'm not. I don't mind four by three, and I honestly don't see why people would mind four by three. Yeah, I I've never had an issue um, with four by three, and when I think it was Planet of Fire, I believe had the um, sixteen by nine treatment, and I think it was the final story with the black and white guardian. Do you remember which one that was? Um, the one with like, all the flying ships. Enlightenment. Enlightenment. That's the one. With that one, they also cropped that, and they did it in a a movie length. And I was kind of, I haven't seen it, but when people say, well, they tur- they they've chopped it down and they've done the extra CGI and they've done it into sixteen by nine, I kind of think, okay, perhaps I can understand chopping it to sixteen by nine, but not doing it like sixteen by nine and a movie version. I would much prefer to see updated effects like they're doing on the um, the Blu-ray box sets. Yeah. Like they're doing the original aspect ratios and they're trying to stay true to the original effects, but enhancing it and um, recreating it, adding extra things in. I, I feel as though that yeah. approach is much better than... Um, yeah. I mean, I think... The only reason you should deviate and take creative liberties is if it looks better. Yeah, I agree. You know? Um, if it looks more true to what's actually happening as opposed to, oh, we, we, we don't know how to do this like thing in Revenge of the Cybermen, so let's just have a spinning potato Yeah. in I front of the camera lens, just... You know. Yeah, there, there's certain things that you can say. Okay, well, let's change that up a bit. I mean, uh, I think it was Re- the Revenge of the Cybermen. They had uh, footage of, I think it was the Cyber Ship taking off. They had um, used stock footage of the Saturn V rocket launching, um, I think, for Apollo 11, um, and then. Yeah. And then they enhanced the actual Saturn V rocket so it looked a bit more like the cyber ship or something along those lines. But I can see why they did that, because they wanted to make it look a lot more like it was. They didn't change the footage all that much, but they enhanced it so that it was... It was... It made more sense to the story. Yeah. And I actually, I actually personally think the Gopolis did really good with its oh, CGI because it, it's it it felt natural. It did so much to enhance the actual telling of the story. I I watched it. Um, I I introduced my girlfriend um to season series eleven um when it first came out, and since then I said, okay, I've got a box set. Will you watch Legopolis with me? And she was a bit um, cautious because I'd shown her the first episode of Castro Valva, and that was a mistake. Because if you look at the first episode of Castro Valva, totally out of con, um, out of uh, yeah context. Yeah, totally out of context. Um, I could see why she was getting confused. Mm. She after the end of the episode, she looked at me and went, "What the hell was that?" And I could totally understand why she did that because it is, it, it's, it's totally outlandish. But we watched Legopolis, and I was like, okay, what did you think? And she said that she actually enjoyed it. It wasn't her favourite, but she said she enjoyed it a, a lot. Yeah. Not loads and loads, but she said I I actually quite like that. And I think part of it was because. I switched it to the new effects, and it looked a lot more cinematic. Obviously, it, it was by no means um, a, a cinematic masterpiece. Yeah. Because they were trying to do... But the things that they did, was it was stunning. I mean, being somebody who'd seen the original episodes as they were, I saw it and I thought, oh, this is brilliant. I love this. Yeah. It was amazing. And I think that doing it that way, having the enhancements like that were very much um, it was a good decision on uh, the part of the people 
who were doing the enhancements and it, it, it enhances the story um, as well and I think that was something that benefited the story a, a lot because it was a confusing story and when you're working on a 1980s BBC budget you're kind of um, you're limited to what you can do but when you've got the kind of technology we have I think it helps to convey the story a lot better yeah so um mo moving topics a little bit um i mean so sorry if it feels like i keep going back to big finish that's sort of like the no, main that's, that's sort of my uh, main area of influence like i'm gonna have to wrap uh, wrap up soon because i've got to get up early to uh leave uh, for holiday tomorrow but, True. Um, no, no, carry on. but I said that Big Finish had multiple like sort of dra dramas and controversies but I didn't bring up the big one I mean I brought up b and I brought up the Companion Chronicles thing the Companion Chronicles thing is more just me not being happy but yeah um they keep casting James Dreyfus as the master and he's not a nice guy at all. I've heard of this. Um, are you asking for my opinion? Well, what is your opinion on this? This, this is the kind of thing I have tried to stay away from. I'm, I, I will always answer people's questions on it, but um, I am always very careful of what I say and what I comment on. Yes. Yeah. I mean, especially nowadays, social media, I mean, you apply for a job, and it is true, whenever you have these talks in schools or whatever, but you, and you see it on the news, you say such and such has been uh, fired from whatever job because of something they said online 13 years ago on some um, .NET board in 1999 on yeah. dial-up internet on a, some kind of forum somewhere. Someone somehow will find it. And obviously, once you say something online... It's right. It is there forever. Now, the things that people say are, like I say, I, I try to avoid um, these kinds of discussions, especially on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think more um, via text rather than actually, actually talking to people. I think um, that they are not says is, is right. Um, however, I think if if they're going to wrap up a story arc, um, then I can kind of see why they would cast him, because if, if you're trying to wrap up somebody's story arc, I, I would kind of understand yeah. why you would cast somebody um, if you want to wrap up their story so that it makes sense, because you will always have people who go, hey, that, that story arc was never finished. Like, Moffat's story arcs. I mean, you, you have the whole crack in time, you have yeah. the silence and fall when the question is asked. And it, when it came to the final episode, um, the time of the Doctor, it kind of felt like it was in a, in a series crammed into an hour's long episode. Mm. So I can see why, in that circumstance, people would cast somebody who they previously cast as an, as an existing character to round up their story. However, if this is, because like I said, I don't often listen to Big Finish, when mm -hmm. I do, I enjoy it. If they're casting this person, yeah. despite the fact that they, they know that what they're saying is wrong, and they know of their activities, and they know that this is actually a character that they could, not necessarily bin, but they could just kind of phase out, yeah. then... I think that that's definitely the better option. You can't, you can't ever accept something that everybody everybody knows is wrong. You you should. Yeah. I don't think Big Finish is promoting it by any means. I think they're just trying to make sure yeah. that they're tying up any loose ends. I mean, again, I will stress this. I don't really know um, too much about it because I tried to avoid it. But if this person is saying horrible things about anybody, I really don't think that there is any reason why they should be kept on but yeah if it's if it's something where unanimously everybody says okay i think we should get rid of this guy then by all means do it but if it's something where 
they, they are trying to wrap up something, then I think let it run its course because you obviously I don't condone anything. Yeah. I think if you let it um, wrap up its course and then just say, okay, we'll leave it there. We don't need to. We don't need to talk about that. It, it, it's done. That chapter yeah. has finished his life. It, that character is no longer there. I think they should just fa- phase him out and say, okay, well, we'll we won't use this character again. I think it, in terms of a logical way, that w- seems to be the logical way to go about. Yeah. It, rather than blatantly um, pointing a finger at somebody and saying you're fired. Obviously, don't ever condone the kind of things that they say. Yeah. But say, okay, right. Well, this is unacceptable. We're going to have to finish your character and then do it in a calm way so as not to provoke anything. Nobody gets hurt. Nobody gets unnecessarily. It, it, whatever they say, just say, okay, that's it. Yeah. It's done. But like I say, I, I don't like to talk about things like this because you, you do have to, you're always going to upset somebody. Yeah. I say. And. I've always tried to make sure that I make the best decision to make sure that everybody's happy and nobody's upset about anything. And for the most part, as long as you just say, okay, well, really, no comment, um, then I think that it, it's... Somebody's got to speak up. Yeah. Um, but often, that person isn't me. Yeah. thing is, with, um, with James Dreyfus, he thing is not everyone ever is unanimously saying oh what he's saying is wrong or even if they do they're like oh it's his opinion even though sure it's his opinion but the thing is he's he's transphobia is a very touchy subject and quite frankly if you think about it it is inherently wrong so, and also, James Dreyfus' mas- master is not part of any arc. He's just another actor they cast to play the master, because right. they, they've knowing used that, six. <laughs> knowing that, I would just say, just just get rid of it. The, the stories, keep the stories there, because yeah. w- whether or not they're part of somebody else's story arc, I, again, I don't know. But yeah. knowing that it, he's not part of any specific arc, I would just say... Okay, just just leave it there. Don't don't encourage it, but just leave it where it is. I think that is the main thing. They shouldn't cast him again. Yeah, is I think probably the consensus of everybody. But again, I, I won't speak for people. Yeah, um, I won't put words in people's mouths. And I, yeah, like I said, people people need to speak up. I I usually like I say I steer clear of it and i say well i have an opinion but not everybody wants to hear my opinion um i I often get in heated debates with some of my friends um about either their political views or whatever and i say look people can believe what they want and and you know i mean everything about brexit i won't go into it but i have had yeah occasion where i've I've been talking to someone and they've said no you're wrong and i say well not necessarily I mean, one person said this, the other person said something that contradicts this, and this is the fact. I'm presenting you with the fact, and you're telling me that my fact, which has been confirmed, is wrong. Okay, fine. You can yeah. run with that. I, I don't have. I would. I would never have a problem with anybody having a different opinion. I mean, like I was talking about Bolasrek the other day. Yeah. He doesn't like series eleven. That's blatantly obvious. Yeah. It's okay. I, I like I've said. I've I've been typing out comments and going. Right, I can I can say something now, and I go actually. Why? What am I saying it for? Because yeah. he can he can think this, and I can think what I think. And yeah. at the end of the day, it, it doesn't really matter because he he he's providing content for one part of the fandom that's opposite to maybe yourself or I. I mean, we're all part of one big family where you know our combined love for Doctor Who is the thing that joins us together. And that's the most important thing to focus on. It's not whether or not you like Series 11. It's not whether or yeah. not you agree with the creative choices being taken by the production team. It's not whether or not you agree with whether or not this is canon or that is canon. It's just the fact that whatever our opinion, we all like Doctor Who. Yeah. And 
for many people, it's a massive part of their lives. I've yeah. been watching Doctor. I had a De David Tennant figure since I was about two, and it, it. I moved house for the first time when I was two and a half. And my mum says that she can remember me having a David Tennant figure in our first house, and I think, yeah, it's been a part of my life for so long. I I can't imagine a time when I haven't loved Doctor Who, whether or not I've fallen in and out of it. I mean, I liked yeah. Star Trek for a time. I kind of thought, ah, Doctor Who, I like Star Trek. But now it's got to the point where I've gone, no, no, Doctor Who is my show. And it belongs to all of us. It's not just something that belongs yeah. to the BBC. It's not just their intellectual property anymore. It's everybody's, you know, because when we dream or, um, I mean, we talk about stuff like this, you know, we invent stories as we go along and it's not just one person's intellectual property anymore. I think um, it's everybody's and we have a right to um, think up stories and have opinions and everything yeah. much in the same way that we can have opinions on what clothes that we wear, you know, I wore, I wear some terrible combinations of clothes. Like I'm, I'm saying like borderline sick doctor, kind of going on there. The shirts that I wear, they can be gaudy. They can be absolutely hideous. The color combinations, my word, you would. Oh God, I have a friend like that. I, I mean, it's not actually that bad at the moment. I'm, I'm quite well coordinated, but there are some moments where, somewhat, I will, I will be ready to go out with a friend or something, and they will say. Isaac, go and change. I'm not being seen with you like that. And I go, yeah, fair enough. You know, but I don't mind dressing like that. Like I have an orange shirt that is very 70s. It's colourful orange and tan and brown. Um, some people would say, Isaac, that looks hideous. Take it off. But myself, my opinion is, yeah, it's all right. I don't mind. And I'll wear it. And that's yeah. fine. Because I can. And I'm entitled to that. But other people are perfectly within their rights to say, Isaac, put something else on i don't want to speak seen with you like that yeah that's fine because you know they can think that and i can most of the time i'll agree i will agree with them mm -hmm. well i guess that's a perfect way to end it off because that was inspirational Thank just everyone much. has their own opinions yeah there we go that's my message if there's anything that people take away from this be optimistic. Yeah. Um, I think it was the 13th Doctor who said, um, I can't even remember the quote now. She said something along the lines of, um, always look towards the future, yeah. always go to places, the universe will surprise you. Something like yeah. that. That's very profound. And for all people complaining about Chris Chibnall's writing, I think that's probably the most profound thing he's ever written. And it's very, very true. Yeah. Whatever happens, take away from this, be optimistic, do what you like within reason. So, Don't yeah. do anything I wouldn't do. That leaves the door open. That hang. Yeah. So, um, if this does make it out, if everything is usable, because it might not be, <laughs> uh, I would like to thank everyone who's currently listening, just for listening, and, yeah, I shall be back next month for another Matt and Co. Talk Who, where I will have a different batch of guests, or a single guest, because who knows? You hope. I, I, I hope, like, unless if I become ill or, like, my laptop explodes, like, there will be another Matt and Co. Talks Who with at least one other guest. Well, it's been, it's been a pleasure coming on the show. I, do you know what? This is the first time I've actually had, um, like, a proper conversation with a whole load of Doctor Who fans who understand exactly what I'm saying. <laughs> I mean, um, it's a pleasurable I'm, experience, you know? Yeah, it is. That's why I did this series in the first place, to be honest. It's, it's nice, especially because, like, a lot of people would say, oh, I'm going to try and get this writer in, or I'm going to try and get one of the big YouTubers. But the fact that you're like, eh, put art on Twitter, want to join in? It, that's brilliant. Because, yeah. Because uh, I would never have had this opportunity because this, this is literally just about Doctor Who fans talking about Doctor Who, and I think that's fun. It's a good show. Everybody subscribe and like and give him money and chocolate and stuff. Yeah. Um, I mean, this whole series exists because, like, I try to make podcasts and fail because, you know, tangents are abound. So I'm just like, screw it, let's just talk about Doctor Who. And if it leads places, it leads places. You know? That's the whole point yeah. of this series. And, like, of course, like... You know, I did an interview with Robert Sherman, like, last month, but 
oh, you I know, saw that. yeah. Nice. Yeah, I, I just asked him politely, but it's not like I try to get like huge people to draw house. This is just for fun. Like the Rob yeah. Sherman interview, that was just you know that was that wasn't even okay. I uh, we need to be famous. No, it's just like it's a good celebration of what we're doing this month. So I enjoy I've I've enjoyed being on the show. Thank yeah. you very much for having me. Yeah, and as I said, I'll see everyone next month. Take care now, everyone.